Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Let's stand as we read God's Word. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Welcome to all of you watching online. We're so happy to have you here today. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. When he came, uh, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little girl, my little daughter, is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she might be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him, and thronged about him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, You say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. You may be seated. Have you ever heard of the surrender cobra? Have you ever heard of the surrender cobra? According to the slang dictionary, a surrender cobra is found at sporting events with a head atop, a hands atop head pose made by fans when their team's loss seems inevitable. <laughs> this is from last night. This is a Miami fan. It's what sports fans do when their team is getting beat so bad. Like that Alabama fan right there. Or a play in the game seems that their team is now inevitably going to use. It is a, who put that up? <laughs> it's a sign of surrendering to the inevitable. Losing all faith in your team's ability to win the game. Well, over the years, I have done a lot of surrender cobras watching UK football and UK basketball. It is that moment. You've, you've done it, right? It's a moment of total deflation, helplessness, hopelessness, where the only answer is a miracle. Have you ever been there in life where you're so helpless and you're so hopeless that the only answer in your life is a miracle? Well, that's a good place to be. And that's what we're looking at this morning as we read two miracle stories, a picture in a picture. Mark here in this section of miracles has taught us that Jesus has power over everything, everywhere. 
As we've walked these past two or three Sundays, we see that Jesus has power over all natural disasters. He has power over demons. And today we see that he has power over all disease and even death itself. The purpose of Mark's writing in this section is not just so that we would believe in miracles, but ultimately that we would trust in Jesus. And so in these two miracles, we see Jesus both commending and calling for faith in what seems to be impossible circumstances. See, in these stories that we just read, we learn what real biblical faith looks like. And so I want to give you a definition of biblical faith. Not the, but a definition. Here's what it is. Real faith is believing in Jesus when you are helpless. And it's trusting in Jesus when things seem hopeless. Believing in Jesus when you are helpless and trusting in Jesus when you feel like everything is hopeless. So we'll see that as we walk through. Number one, believing in Jesus when you are helpless, verse 21, Jesus has crossed again to the other side. Last week, if you were with us, Jesus was just begged to leave the Decapolis, the city of Gadara, uh, because he had healed a demon-possessed man and the pigs flew off the cliff and 2,000 of them drowned. Jesus and his disciples were told to leave the area. And so Jesus gets on the boat, goes to the other side of the sea, the Jewish side, to a sleepy fishing town by the name of Magdala. Uh, Magdala means fish tower. And as soon as Jesus steps off the boat, a great crowd of people was there following Jesus, there to see Jesus. That's one thing that you'll see as a constant theme in Mark's gospel, is that everywhere Jesus is, there's a crowd. And this crowd of people wanted to touch Jesus, wanted to see Jesus, wanted to hear from Jesus. And so in the midst of this crowd, verse 22 tells us that there was a man who came to him who was a ruler of the synagogue, a man by the name of Jairus. Uh, he, as the ruler of the synagogue, which we talked about before, was a volunteer overseer. He was not the rabbi. But he was responsible for the supervision of the, the synagogue, the building itself, the community services that took place during the week in the synagogue, and also the Shabbat services on Saturday and the gatherings. And so normally a ruler of the synagogue would be well known in the community. Like they, you would clearly easily identify them. They were highly respected, well educated, um, and, and they were normally people of high class and affluence and very wealthy. And so here this man is. Jesus has just stepped off the boat. The crowd of people are there. And he immediately comes to see Jesus and falls immediately at Jesus' feet. Now, this is just like the demon-possessed man who saw Jesus from afar and fell down at Jesus' feet. Here this man falls at Jesus' feet. And let me just let you in on something. Every one of you in the, this room and everyone in the entire world is going to one day fall at the feet of Jesus. But here, this man publicly humiliates or humbles himself. He is begging from Jesus. Now, maybe in our mindset, well, this maybe seems somewhat normal, but no grown Jewish man of high class would have ever done this. Jews, uh, Jewish men in Jesus' day were very stoic. They never ran. They never were in a hurry. So that's why the story of the prodigal son seems so counterintuitive, because a, a Jewish man never ran. So what would make this, this man fall at the feet of Jesus. What would make this man of high class and affluence and wealth, why would he do this? And he tells us why. He comes to Jesus and he says that my little daughter is at the point of death. Now we know that she's 12 years old. Why does he call her little, little daughters? Because any of you that are dads of daughters, your daughter is always your little daughter, right? And this is a term of love. It's a term of endearment because there's no kind of pain like kid pain. Luke tells us that this was his only daughter, perhaps his only child, and here she is at the very last moments of her life. Hospice has been called in, and here this dad is desperate, and he's helpless. And so he says to Jesus, he says, come lay your hands on her so that she may be well and that she may live. Now, for this guy to do this would be very, very strange, especially since Jesus had just basically been kicked out of every synagogue in the area. And the reason why is because the rulers of the synagogue have just pretty much said that his message is too radical and he's too big of a threat to the status quo. But yet this man, Jairus, he didn't care about his reputation or his position. He cared about his daughter and he believed that Jesus was the only one who could help. 
See, all of his wealth and all of his power and all of his influence could not do anything to help. Couldn't do one thing to heal his daughter. Even though his friends and colleagues may have thought he was absolutely crazy, he believed that Jesus could do what he could not do himself. And so he falls at the very mercy of Jesus. And he doesn't say, Jesus, can you save my daughter? But he's saying, will you save my daughter? And so, verse 24, the Bible says, and Jesus went with him. Could you imagine the relief? Jairus publicly humbled himself, knowing that Jesus was his only hope. And Jesus says, yes. If, if I were Jairus, we would be rushing with Jesus. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm late, I'm late. We got to go, we got to go, we got to go. Just imagine the, the ambulance sounds I would probably be making. Let's go. We got to go. We got to move because there's crowds of people trying to touch Jesus, slowing Jesus down. Everything is going. This guy needs to get his, this, this Jesus to his house to save his daughter. And then verse 25 tells us, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. While they were pressing through the crowds, there was a woman in the throng of people. This woman has a chronological, gynecological hemorrhage. It's uncontrolled bleeding. So in the midst of the hustle of moving Jesus to Jairus' house, we now have a picture in a picture. There's something that stops Jesus. And this woman is now coming to the forefront. And what we learn about her is that she had an incurable condition. The Bible says that she suffered much. That word suffered much can be translated to be tormented or to be tortured. Not uh, Not just by her disease was she tormented, but also by the treatment she received from her doctors. The Bible tells us here that she went from doctor to doctor, spent all the money that she had only to go from bad to worse. See, for her, the doctor's cure was worse than the disease itself. And, and there's probably reason why, because often those who were called doctors in first century Israel were more, more or less religious leaders who had really no medical or biological knowledge at all. How we know that is if you'll read the writings of the Babylonian Talmud, which came out of the Babylonian captivity period, uh, the Babylonian Talmud describes 11 cures for a discharge of blood. And so these are 11 cures. And if you read them, they're, they're rather strange. Let me give you a couple of cures that, uh, that these doctors came up with. One was for a woman who had a discharge of blood. She used to sit at a crossroads in town, drink a potion of wine, onions, cumin, saffron, and fenugreek, while a man sneaks up behind her and scares her, saying, be gone, discharge your blood. Okay, that's an interesting way. Scare it out of you. A second one is this. Hold the dung from a white mule in your hand for three days. And the bleeding will cease forever. This was very, very experimental medicine. (laughs) Okay. And she paid a pretty penny for this advice. And it went from bad to worse. But not only was she incurable, but she was isolated. According to Leviticus chapter 15, this woman was ceremonially unclean. She was untouchable in society. If if you've ever heard of the Indian people, the the caste of the untouchables, the Dalets, if you are in certain parts of India, if you were born with any physical handicap, any physical abnormality, uh, parents often just abandon the child or they abort the child or kill the child. And if you just survive this, you're part of the Dalets, the untouchables. Stay away from them. It's because you have bad karma. The reason you were born with some deformity is because in your past life, you were bad. And so karma is coming to bite you. 
And so this woman was untouchable in society, like a leper. No one could be around her. She couldn't go around anyone. She wasn't allowed to marry. If she was married before, no doubt her husband divorced her with cause. She wasn't able to have kids because of this hemorrhage. And she couldn't go to church. She couldn't go to worship. And she couldn't receive a hug. And probably no one touched her other than her doctor's for 4,380 days, 12 years. For 12 years, she was unclean, unwanted, and alone. She'd heard reports of Jesus, verse 27. She'd heard all that Jesus had been doing for people, and so she sees Jesus with this man, Jairus, and she's coming up, and the Bible says she came up behind him and touched his garment. That word garment, in the King James, it says the hem of his garment. It, it can be translated the corner, corner tassel of his prayer shawl. And that day, rabbis wore prayer shawls. Religious men wore prayer shawls. These prayer shawls were used, obviously, during prayer, but pretty much worn at all times. The, the, it's like a, kinda like a big scarf. And at the bottom of here, at the bottom of the, the garment on both sides would be 613 tassels combined. Uh, normally it would be uh, in some sort of blue or blue and white uh, knotted together tassels. And these 613 tassels represented the 613 laws of the Torah. And according to the superstition of that day, that when Messiah comes, if you were to touch the corner of his, ta- the corner of his prayer shawl, the wings of his, ta- of his prayer shawl, you could be healed. And they get this superstition from Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, which was a prophecy of the Messiah that when he comes, here's what God says, but you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And so this word wings, healing in wings, the word wings there can also be translated corner, which comes from the Hebrew word kanaf. Now, I know this is really exciting, but the Hebrew word kanaf is found in Numbers chapter 15, verse 37, in which there God talks about these tassels on the prayer shawl that was to be worn by holy people. And here, this is the same word kanaf, wings can be kanaf. And so what Malachi is saying is that, there, that when, the, when the Messiah comes, there shall be healing in his kanaf. There'll be healing in the corner of his garments. And so this woman, hearing, knowing this passage, hearing the superstition, says to herself in verse 28, this is an internal monologue, if I could even touch his garments, if I could touch his kanaf, I will be made well. See, in her desperation, she saw Jesus as her final help for healing her last resort after the money was wasted and the doctors have failed. And here I believe that she believed that Jesus was Hamashiach. He was the Messiah. And just one touch of the corner of his prayer shawl would heal her life forever. And so as Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house, she comes in and she sneaks up and she sneaks in and she touches And she runs. She wanted to drive by healing. (laughs) A touch and go. And the Bible says that when she touched the hem of his garment, the kanaf, the corner of his prayer shawl, that immediately the blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed. She was made whole. Just a touch of the hem of his garment did what doctors could not do and all her money could not do for 12 years. Verse 30 says that Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone from him in the same instance that she feels the blood stop flowing out of her, Jesus feels the power flowing out of him. And so Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples look at Jesus and said, hey, we're in a crowd. And and Peter, actually, we know, said this basically to Jesus. Jesus, who didn't touch you? We're in this throng of people. Everybody's trying to touch you. And that's the truth is, listen, a lot of people touch Jesus casually. This woman touched Jesus intentionally. Her touch was a touch of faith. 
throwing herself at the mercy of Jesus. Verse 32 says that Jesus looked around. He, he says, who touched me? Who touched me? It wasn't that Jesus didn't know. He knew who touched him, but he wanted her to know that he knew what happened to her. And he wanted her to come forward, to come into public. Why would Jesus do this to this woman? This poor woman has had to live in the shadows of shame for 12 years. Why would she have to come public? Because Jesus loved her. He knows exactly what she needs. See, for 12 years she's lived in isolation, forced to live away from everybody. The shackles of shame needed to be broken in her life. She needed to come public. You know, sometimes we come to church or we go to a Christian concert or we go to a Bible study and we just want to touch. We just want power. We, we just want comfort. We just want a little direction. And once we get a little warm fuzzy, once we get a little comfort, once we get a little direction, we just want to slip away. We just want a quick fix, a, a quick blessing, and then just move on. But I want you to understand that God wants more for you than that. See, God is not some sort of cosmic vending machine. He doesn't just want you to be a consumer because I'm afraid that some people, they just, they come into church late and they leave church early and they get a little touch, a little warm fuzzy and they head out off on their merry way when God says there's so much more I want to give you than that. So she comes in fear and trembling. She didn't plan this. She wanted to touch and go. She wanted to go back into hiding, but yet she knew she was caught. And so she tells the whole story. She tells the entire truth. And in this moment, she is expecting a rebuke. Because in this day, a woman didn't speak to a rabbi, let alone touch a rabbi. Especially an unclean woman like her. She's expecting Jesus now to be angry and to reject her like she's been rejected by everyone else all of her life. But instead of a rebuke, verse 34, he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Instead of a rebuke or a condemnation, there's words of affirmation. Daughter. The same word daughter used by Jairus, the dad. Daughter. Do you understand? Maybe you don't, or maybe you didn't know this, but this is the only time that Jesus ever called anyone daughter. It's a term of endearment. This woman was not just another face in the crowd unknown to Jesus. No, this was a daughter to Jesus. See, Jesus in that moment gave her something greater than just a physical healing. As a matter of fact, it's, it's seen in the text. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. That word made well is translated 89 times in the Gospels as to save two times in the Gospels as to be made well. It's the Greek word sozo. We get our word salvation from it or saved from it. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you, not just physically, but spiritually, socially, and emotionally. See, salvation is freedom from the after effects of sin. So you can think of your salvation in three tenses. You know, you're taught in grammar that there are three tenses, past, present, and future. And so when, if you are a believer, if you are saved, if you by faith trusted Jesus and have intentionally, intentionally put your faith and trust in him, then you are saved. And if you are saved, it's in three tenses. And here's the first one. You can say, I have been saved from the penalty of sin that I don't have to pay for my sins because Jesus paid it all. There is no condemnation for me because I am in Christ Jesus. Therefore, when God sees me, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see my sin. And so I have been saved from the wrath and the condemnation that I deserve for my sins. I've been saved from the penalty of sin. But that's in the past. I am being saved 
from the power of sin, that right now in the presence, I have the ability by the Holy Spirit of God to say yes to God and no to sin. I don't have to be a slave to my sin. I don't have to be a slave to my past. I don't have to live in shame or guilt or fear anymore because I am being saved from the power of sin. But in the future, I will be saved because I have been saved from the penalty of sin and I am being saved from the power of sin, I will be saved one day from the presence of sin. That there is coming a day where there will not be one stain or sin in my life. I will not be angry. I will not be lustful. I will not be greedy. There will be no sin in my life and the presence of sin will be far from me in hell. If you are saved, you have been saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved from the power of sin. And you are being, and you will be saved from the very presence of sin because salvation is freedom from the after effects of sin. And that's what happened to this woman. She wanted a touch and go, but she got way more. See, what this woman needed was love. She needed love more than she needed physical relief. See, salvation is not just the forgiveness of sin, but it's a new identity. It's not less than the forgiveness of sin, but, but even greater, it's a new identity. Jesus, in this moment, calls her daughter. Think about this. This woman had no father to stand for her. She had this medical condition. We don't hear her dad coming to Jesus like Jairus comes to Jesus. And so, because this woman did not have a father to stand for her, Jesus stands in the gaps and claims her as his own. Wow. He is father to the fatherless, defender of the weak. And he proclaims to everyone in Magdala and to all of us today that this woman is restored, accepted, and lovely in his sight. That's the beauty of the gospel. That we are dirty, unclean, not good enough, outcast because of our sins. And yet Christ set his love on us when he could have turned away from us. He chose to run towards us to love us and to heal us because we were helpless. Let me just let you in on something. You say, well, hey, yeah, clearly Jairus was helpless. And clearly this woman was helpless. But I'm not helpless. Oh, yes, you are. And until you admit you're helpless, you won't have faith. Because faith is believing when you're helpless. And when are you helpless? All the time. Because real faith understands that if Jesus doesn't help me, I have no help. Because my help comes from the Lord. Faith is believing in Jesus when you're helpless. Number two, faith is trusting in Jesus when things seem hopeless. Verse 35, while Jesus is still speaking to this woman, while all this is going on, Jesus is looking for somebody, talking to somebody. Who's standing there waiting? Jairus. <laughs> could, could, could you imagine? He's probably losing his mind. I mean, he wasn't he wouldn't going to rebuke Jesus. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. But he's like, oh, and he's probably praying, God, please don't let my baby die. Please don't let my baby die. Please don't let my baby die. God, please don't let my baby die. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes to Jesus and Jairus and says, it's too late. Your daughter is dead. This week, we had a young man in our church a tragic car accident, died instantly on Livingston Road. And this week, a mother had to hear the words that every parent fears to hear, and that is your child is dead. Jairus' worst fears have become a reality. And probably in his mind, he's saying, we're just too late. And doesn't this seem cruel? Doesn't it seem cruel that what Jesus is doing to this man? Because, listen, if Jesus were a medical doctor, he would be sued for malpractice. 
I mean, Jesus stopped to help some woman with a chronic condition that wasn't life-threatening while making someone with an acute condition wait. I mean, Morgan and Morgan would be all over that. And the person says, don't bother the rabbi any further. There's nothing that Jesus can do anymore. It's pointless. It's hopeless. It's a lost cause. She's dead. But what that person didn't realize is that Jesus specializes in lost causes. <laughs> Verse 36, Jesus overheard what they said, what they told Jairus. And, and instead, of, instead of doing anything, Jesus looks at Jairus, speaks to the heart of Jairus and says, do not fear, only believe. When it seems hopeless, when others say it cannot happen, don't listen. Trust in me. Jairus in that moment probably had every expectation of Jesus dashed. And yet Jesus says, don't fear. Do you know God knows your heart? He says, don't fear. Believe. Be patient. I got this. You know the one thing that we see in the Bible and the Gospels is that Jesus is never in a hurry. But he's always right on time. You know, we don't see the time the way God sees time. We, we often don't see time the way others see time. You know, every culture has a different view and sense of time. Anthropologists and sociological studies show that there are differences between how people view time and events. People from cold weather cultures typically see time as a planned moment, a certain point in time. And people from warm, warm, uh, warm weather cultures typically see time as an event that's relevant. And so there was a, a time in my last church that, that I had a wedding at 4 o'clock and the bride and groom didn't show up till 7 o'clock. They're from a warm weather culture. <laughs> and none of the guests showed up till 7 o'clock. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the guests showed up about 7.15, and the wedding actually kicked off at 7.30 with a 4 o'clock start. <laughs> I am a cold weather culture person. I almost lost my mind. See, with God, time is not just a series of events. With God, time is a story that has character development. See, what seems to be late to us may not be, is not late to God. Because Jesus cares. He cares for you. He often waits or makes us wait because he's developing something in our lives that can only come through waiting and trusting in him. But that's difficult in the 21st century because I don't like to wait. The great theologian Tom Petty said that waiting is the hardest part. In our instant world of insta everything, we want things when we want them. But God doesn't work in our timetables. And as one man said, God's delays are not God's de denials. But God's delays are often a greater opportunity to trust in him. And so verse 37 he allowed no one to, go, to follow except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James, the brother of James. Verse 38, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. The girl is dead. Jesus goes to the house. There's a commotion. There are people wailing and, and weeping. Who are these people? Well, what we know is that these were professional paid mourners. These people got paid to cry for a living, to mourn for a living. Often they would mourn seven days after the death of a loved one. And according to first century tradition, even the poorest families should hire two flute players and a singer after someone dies. So Jesus comes to these professional mourners and says to them, why are you crying? And they're in their minds saying, because there's a dead girl inside and we've been paid to cry. But Jesus says, the girl is not dead, she's sleeping. Now, what does that mean? Sleeping here 
some people take this and interpret it differently, but sleeping here just means that her death is reversible. That just as you don't sleep forever, you wake up. Jesus is saying, I have come to wake her up. But here's the problem. They hear what Jesus says and they laugh because they knew what dead looks like. They've been scarred by the reality of, uh, of death. That they mourn for dead people for a living. And they know what it looks like. And when, when Jesus says, no, this girl isn't dead, she's sleeping, they laugh. Why? Because they didn't believe in Jesus. They were cynical of Jesus. Kevin DeYoung says that a fool is someone who has expectations divorced from reality. A cynic is someone who has expectations divorced from Jesus. Cynicism, often people say that are cynical, well, I'm a realist. Well, cynicism is really at the root of it, unbelief. And I'll be honest with you, in our day and age with all that's going on in our world and and especially in politics and in just society, it's really easy for us to become cynical. And the older you get, the more cynical you can become. And, And that's why a lot of people become curmudgeons when they get older because cynicism guards us from the disappointments of life. Cynicism keeps us from believing and hoping because year after year, time after time, we have learned that it normally doesn't work out the way we want. And so it becomes easy to stop believing. It becomes easy to stop hoping against all odds because of constant disappointment. And the reality is, listen, as even believers, the reality is, is at times we should be pessimists because we know the nature of sin in the world. I mean, listen, Regardless of who wins the election Tuesday, the world is still in trouble. Okay? It just is. Whether it's a mule or an elephant or a kangaroo in the White House, it doesn't matter. Because of the nature of sin in the world, we sh- there are times we should be pessimists, but we should always be optimists because we know the power of Jesus over the world. See, we should never be surprised by how bad life can get, but we should never lose hope by how much Jesus can help. So everyone's laughing. And so verse 40b, Jesus kicks everyone out except for the inner three and this girl's parents. He takes the little girl by the hand, verse 41, and says, Talitha kumi or Talitha kum. It's Aramaic. I like saying Aramaic. It's not Arabic, it's not Hebrew, it's not Greek, it's Aramaic. Aramaic is the the common tongue of the people in first century Palestine, in first century Israel. The scholars spoke Hebrew, the men spoke Hebrew, the, the, the business people spoke Greek because it was the it was the language of business. But the common people at home spoke Aramaic. This 12 year old girl. Jesus speaks to her in a language she can understand and says, Telethakum. Oh, I love it. Little girl, get up. Honey, it's time to get up. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to wake up my daughter, Anna. It's so sweet. She's so sweet in the morning. Now the rest of the day, (laughs) different story. (laughs) I like coming into her room. Me and her mother will come in there and we'll give her a big hug and we'll say, Anna Banana, wake up. And she's a morning person, so she wakes up so happy. This little girl hears Jesus say, get up. And she gets up, and Jesus says, feed her, because 12-year-olds are hungry. She went from death to life. Jesus reached down into death, took the little girl by the hand, and brought her out of the grave. See, when Jesus is holding your hand, death is just taking a nap. See, there's a day that that I'm going to die. There's a day that you're going to die. But if you are in Christ, you don't have to be afraid. I mean, think about this. The first person this little girl saw when she opened her eyes was Jesus. The first voice she heard when she came back to life was Jesus' voice. The first touch that she felt in her resurrected body was Jesus' touch. 
And what she felt in that moment, all believers will experience in eternity. But not to rise in this old nasty world, but to rise in the new one to come. See, if you are a follower of Jesus, you will be totally healed one day. See, some of you are struggling with malady. Some of you have family members that are sick and maybe on the very verge of death. Hospice has been called in. And here's what I want you to understand. All healing from God, this side of eternity, is temporary. It's just procrastination of the inevitable. This girl died and was raised to only die again. Because that's what happened. But her hope was not in living in this world forever. That would be horrible. Her hope was being raised to live in the next. So Jesus says, Mom and Dad, don't tell anybody. What does that tell us? This is not a publicity stunt. Jesus did this because he loved this girl and he loved the faith of her parents. Oh, I just want to take a little side note. Do you understand that God sees your faith parents? And he loves your child more than you do? Just think about that. Jairus was hoping for a cure, but got a resurrection. He risked everything, his reputation, his position, and trusted in Jesus regardless of what the cynics said. That's faith. Faith is believing in Jesus when you're helpless, and faith is trusting in Jesus when you are hopeless. So let's end. In these four miracle stories that we have seen, if you've been with us these past two or three weeks, we have seen that Jesus has the power to give safety to his disciples, sanity to a demon-possessed man, community to a destitute woman, and has the ability to bring a dead girl back to life. These miracles reveal and authenticate who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do. Each miracle of Jesus was a sign of what was to come. But, but I can't keep going without at least showing the parallels of this miracle. This miracle, which is found in Matthew and in Luke and Mark, and, and especially as Mark sandwiches these miracles together, you'll see there's parallels between these two miracles. Notice this. Both miracles were for women. Both women were called daughter. daughter. Both women were untouchable. One because of her discharge of blood, the other because she was dead. But both were touched by Jesus and were healed. The woman was sick for 12 years. The girl was 12 years old when she died. The day that the girl was born was the year that the woman's sickness started. And the day that the girl died was the day that both were healed. And what Jesus is saying is that's what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is where the touchable are touched, the untouchable are touched, the unclean are made clean, where death is destroyed, where the upper class and lower class are both in equal footing. There is no disease and a day of power, and the kingdom of God is the undoing of all the brokenness and emptiness of this fallen world. But for that, stay with me, for that to be possible and for that to be permanent, Jesus is going to have to exchange his self for us. And we see that, that on the cross, Jesus would bleed for this woman who had an issue of blood. And on the cross, Jesus would die so that this little girl could live. And Jesus went to the cross to take our uncleanliness so that we can get his cleanliness. Jesus took our death so that we could get his life. Jesus was crucified in weakness so that we can live in his power. So until you come to a place where you know you're helpless, until you come to a place where you realize that without Jesus you have no hope, you won't have faith. But if you're here today and you are helpless and you are hopeless, that's the best condition you can be in because it's in the moment of helplessness and hopelessness that Jesus does miracles. 
And the greatest miracle that anyone in this room or anyone watching online could ever receive is the miracle of salvation where you are Jesus's forever. And one day when you die, he's going to say to you, little girl, little boy, arise, get up and be with me forever. Come to Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Be public. Don't be private. Trust in him. Don't surrender to the inevitable. Surrender to Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for this truth that we find in your word. And God, I pray today that whoever is in this room that desperately needs you, that God, today you would find them. That God, as this woman snuck in to get a healing, God, you would come in to hearts and minds today. And Father, we thank you that you are always there. Then when we don't understand, when we can't comprehend, you are there. And Father, today, whoever is in this room that doesn't know you, God, today, would they come to you and would they trust you? In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do something different. I just want you to listen to the words of this song. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's Word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church. Go out and be the church. Have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.